behind us. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for meeting us in that. We'll do a roll call. President David here. Trustee Hankin. Here. Thank you for attending online. Trustee Manning. Here. Thank you. Trustee Morris. Here. Thank you for attending online. And Trustee Rutowski hines Here. Thank you for being here. We have a full board tonight. Uh, we're going to move right along to item number four on the agenda, organization of the board. We need to switch it up a little bit. Um, nominations are accepted from the board for the Office of President and President Pro Tem of the Library Board of Trustees. Elected officers will serve a one-year term. Currently, I'm serving as president, and Trustee Hankin is serving as President Pro Tem. So, we just need a motion, right, for who yes. wants to be president? Yes, um, that you're supposed to do a, a open the floor for nominations, and you're supposed to um, open that up, and then somebody can go ahead and do that. The floor is open for nominations. Well, I would like to nominate um, Trustee Hankin as a president. I will second that. I will, I will also I will third that. <laughs> Trustee Morris, how do you feel about that? I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Trustee, um, oh my gosh, I'm getting everyone's names mixed up. Trustee Hankin, are you um, willing to accept the role of president? Um, yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> Not very enthusiastic. Yeah. Out, that counts. I believe it's, it just says here that you're supposed to um, have everybody give a, a yes on it. If everybody yes, no. All right. So I'll do a, I'll do a roll call vote. All right, Trustee David, how do you vote on Mr. Hankin becoming the president for the next term year? Aye. Trustee Hankin. Aye. Trustee Manning. Aye. Trustee Morris. Aye. And Trustee Rutowski Hines. Aye. Excellent. And for nominations for President Pro Tem, um, I'm. Gonna, I would, you want to go ahead? I, I would suggest Trustee Dolores Morris. All right. I'll second that. Hold up, hold up. Yes. <laughs> speak, speak your mind. Uh, oh, is there anybody else who might want to? I've done it before. I <laughs> want to give her. <laughs> you have been a long time servant on this board, and I acknowledge the many years of service. I was sort of thinking maybe um, Trustee Rutowski Hines, as our newest member, might enjoy that role. Um, nothing against you personally, you do an amazing job. No, I agree with you. <laughs> Ooh, it's a split board. Oh, yippee. <laughs> well, it sounds like um, Trustee Morris is, uh, is honored, but willing to pass the baton. <laughs> Is there any discussion? That sounds exactly right. I love the way you put that, Dolores. That was great. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I totally agree. Unless you want to battle her for the spot, Mr. Manning, how do you feel? No battle. Not no battles. No battles for me either. <laughs> okay. Am I hearing a yes or a no? We're just not hearing here. Well, I, I think that. we're going to remove Trustee Morris from the list of um, President Pro Tem people. Oh, and Nominees. Oh, no, no, yeah, nominees. Because no. she sounds like she wants to pass the baton. How do you feel? I give someone else an opportunity. Yeah. Mr. Manning, do you think that uh, Trustee Rutowski Hines will be able to fulfill those duties? That's fine with me. Sounds great. Let's take a vote. President David, all in favor of nominating Rutowski Hines as the next president pro tem, I say aye. Trustee Hankin? Aye. Thank you. Trustee Manning? Aye. Trustee Morris? Aye. Thanks for being a team sport and Trustee Rutowski Hines. Aye. Great. So the motions carry our next um, one year term. Pres um, we'll be acknowledging President Hankin and President Pro Tem Trustee Rutowski Hines. And I'll look, be looking forward to help me whenever that is needed. Yeah. <laughs> well, running meetings and signing checks. Very yes. exciting. All right. Item number five on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the regular meeting held June 9th, 2020, on the right side of your agendas. I have a motion to approve. Uh, so moved, this is Hankin. Thank you, Trustee Hankin. Do I have a second? I second, this is Morris. If I Thank you, Ms. Morris. I'm gonna make a comment. Yes. One of the other boards I sit on, last month or so ago, we had a consultant on board activity and various other things. 
And he said that on the minutes of the previous meeting, it is not necessary to have an approval from the board. It, what is done is say, are there any changes to the minutes? If there are no changes, then they are accepted at that time. And we all protested and said, no, because we've always done it the way we just did it here. And he sent us Robert's Rules of Orders, and by God, he's right. I mean, it's not a major point, but uh, nonetheless, it was an interesting discussion. But nonetheless, I will second the motion to approve the minutes and let it go with that. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Maybe we can get some insight from our city attorney on that and see whether it's a necessary part of continuing our meetings. So thank you for that second. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Aye. <coughs> Well, that was three, so that's majority. So the motion carries. Uh, well, didn't we all vote on that one? I didn't. I don't think I heard five voices, but it might be the technology. Yes. I didn't hear any okay. notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and thank you also. Um, was it Grace who typed up the minutes? I did. Thank you. Thank you for including all the notes from our last meeting because we did have a pretty extensive discussion. You're thank welcome. you. Um, item number six: public comments on agenda items. Do we have any public comments? Uh, we don't have any public comments on the agenda item. All right, thank you. So we will move forward to item number seven, public comments from the floor. I'm hearing a little feedback. Okay. Do you want to speak on behalf of the friends? So on behalf of the friends, I received the electronic version of the document, the written report to this today. Uh, so I apologize, I did not get it sent to those board uh, trustees who are not here present, but I will send it to you as, an, as a, uh, an email attachment. So that is from the friends. Thank you. All right. Well, no public comments from the floor. And thank you for providing, um, thank you to um, Tina for giving us that, um, that print up of the friends updates. Um, we'll definitely check that out. Item number eight is resolution LB 2020-08, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees of the City of Palmdale, California, ratifying and approving the Palmdale City Library check register for checks dated June 26, 2020, totaling $5,431.92. Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve the uh, check register. Thank you, Trustee Rutowski Hines. Is there a second? Uh, this is Morris. I second it. Thank you, Manning and Morris, for the second. And this is a roll call vote to approve the resolution. So, Trustee David, aye. Trustee Hankin? Aye. Thank you. Trustee Manning? Aye. Thank you. Trustee Morris? Aye. Thank you. And Trustee Rutowski Hines? Aye. Thank you, Madam Future President. <laughs> and the motion carries. No, pro temp. <laughs> well, that's right, that's right. Don't get ahead of yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> resolution item number nine, resolution LB 2020-09, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees in the City of Palmdale, California, designating by title and name those officials who are authorized to sign checks and warrants and repealing resolution LB 2019-11 in its entirety. And just to clarify for everyone, this is the resolution that removes myself and trustee Hankin from signing checks and would authorize, well actually trustee Hankin would still be authorized to sign checks as president and trustee Rutowski Hines, you would be authorized to sign checks for the library also if he's not available, correct? Actually, everybody is gonna sign the form um, when it's all said and done because all of you will, if, yeah, we have to go down the list. If you, you know, president can't do it and the pro, president pro tem and I go down the list, but okay. all of you will still have So it'll list. just reorganize the order of who signs first. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that or discussion before we vote on that? Uh, I have a question. Uh, so Go ahead. I, I have to resign it because it's a new order. It's a new order of. Uh, yes, now. everybody, there's a, a new bank form. It's a Bank of America form that everybody has to sign um, regardless of if you signed it last year or not. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks okay. for that question. I move the approval of resolution LB 2020-09. Thank you. Is there a second? No second. Thank you, Trustee Manning. And we are going to do a roll call vote again. So, Trustee David, aye. 
Trustee Hankin. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Manning. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Morris. Aye. Thank you. And Trustee Rutowski Hines. Aye. Thank you. And the motion carries unanimously. We're so cohesive. All right. Item number 10. Um, item number 10 and 11 I added to the agenda this week. Um, did you want to address the board first, uh, Mr. Shu? Uh, actually, no, I'm just getting up here to be prepared. Okay, I, thank you. you. I would just say, uh, for everyone's information, uh, President David requested the next two items be placed on the agenda, and so we did so, and I'm just here if I can be of any help. Thanks. Um, I did write a statement to open up discussion on number 11, um, but I'll start with item number 10, and I'll kind of fill you guys in on why I added that agenda to the, um, the item to the agenda. Um, when I'm thinking of library patron safety services, I know and I fully trust that our library is taking extreme measures to protect our patrons in regards to COVID-19. Um, our staff has done an amazing job as far as um, updating the website, updating social media with services that are still available. Um, with our pickup service, I've seen evidence on, online of our bookmobile services still happening. Our summer reading program is in action. And I know that the people who are delivering those services are also taking safety precautions, and I want to acknowledge that and appreciate that. Um, in the last two months, the city of Palmdale has faced a lot of um, news in, in the media for Robert Fuller's death, which happened right in front of this building. Um, and what I'm not here to do is discuss the circumstances of how he died or debate that, but the reality is, is that his death affected our community and very specifically our, um, our black community. We have many people in our community who are fearing for their lives right now, not just on public grounds, but even within their homes. Um, the racial tensions in our country are extremely high and many people in the black community feel like they, they can't be safe anywhere. And as a public servant, I want to make sure that we're considering those fears, we're considering those, um, those perceptions and assuring our patrons that the library is aware that safety is a concern and thinking about how can we assure our patrons that it's safe to come to the library, assuring black families it's safe to send your teenagers to an evening program once programming resumes. It's safe to bring your children here and walk it, you know, even in the evening. Um, it's safe to be in the parking lot and how can we not only ensure our patrons of that, those safety measures, but is there anything that we're missing or overlooking that the city might be able to assist us with? Um, one of those measures specifically would be um, surveillance in the parking lots. Um, one of the questions um, during the investigation of Robert Fuller's death was um, video camera surveillance. And I'm wondering if the library has had any conversations with City Hall regarding surveillance in the parking lots. And another question I would propose is, is there something available where if a patron requests an escort to their car, their, um, the city bus stop, um, an Uber ride waiting out front, their bike. Um, if they want to be escorted out for safety, is that an option for our patrons? So I'll let you speak to that as a director. The, uh, the second question, that would always be an option. I, I think, shy of posting a sign that says that, uh, that is the nature of our customer service. Uh, we staff have readily helped people to their cars if, if needed. and. Uh, various situations, uh, whether it's safety concern or mobility issues. So I, I feel confident that we have been doing that and we will continue to do that. Regarding surveillance cameras, I might defer to Eric if uh, you want sure. to say anything. Sure. And, and regarding the sign, I think a sign would be great. Just to just yeah. anything that just furthers that. And whether it's for safety, physical safety, even if it's just someone who feels nervous, like a mom with her kids who wants to be escorted to the car, just having a sign saying if you'd like an escort, kind of like a grocery store. If you'd like to help out with your groceries, we can do that. Yeah, I'm willing to consider that. Thanks. Um, I, will, I will say we haven't had direct conversations per se with, with Robert in the library regarding surveillance and, and cameras. However, um, even if you listen to last night's council meeting, um, our, our uh, city manager and the council expressed an interest and it looks like we're already investigating surveillance and cameras in the city center as well as um, some of our other parks and outside outlying facilities. So that is a topic of discussion Great. Um, and the city is looking into that Thank as we you. speak. Um, and I guess maybe to further that conversation as it happens um, since you're representing um, the city. Sure. Um, wondering if they're not only including the parking lot but things like the plaza or the area near the activity room. Just, just to ensure patrons that the 
eyes are on the, our facilities and that people can feel assured that we're looking out for their safety and their well-being, that it's important to us because perception is a big part of what makes people feel ready to walk into an area. And, and I think um, your suggestions, certainly we can write your suggestions down. I, I, I'm not involved in the study and, and right now, but of course. Um, if, if the board has any specific areas that they would like to be considered for surveillance, that's certainly something that, you know, that we can hear from you on and 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 uh, send on to the decision makers in that in that arena. So Great. certainly, if you have a specific areas or certain you know desires for surveillance, we can certainly um, hear from Jack, the board. Sure. Madam Chair, can I jump here for a minute? Absolutely. We have to be very careful what we're doing here. We remind of what we are. We were appointed by the mayor with the approval of the city council operating under the Education Code of the State of California to deal with the library issues of the city of Palmdale. And that's our charge. When we start talking into policy outside of the library, outside of the Education Code, we are stepping outside of what our assignment is on this board of directors. Remind, we are sitting in the city council chambers. We were elected by nobody. We are appointed by the city to represent the city. Nobody voted for us. The purview of what we're talking about here belongs with the city, perhaps the planning commission, things of that sort. But I question whether we should be getting into this or not. Now, I've discussed this over the past months with a couple of people in the city of Palmdale, and the general agreement is that we should not be, or at least be very careful what we're doing here and stepping outside of our bounds. What we do in our personal lives Obviously, we're free to do that, but we have to remember who we represent here. We were appointed by the mayor and the city council. It's for a specific purpose, and be very careful when we step outside of our bounds. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Can I can I reply to that, or um, Ms. Morris, did you want to reply to that first? No, I, I, I'm really trying to understand what he's actually saying. Uh, you made a couple of comments with regard to what are the Board of Trustees, what our, our duties are, and I'm just wondering what particular duties are you, are we really talking about? I, I think, because I thought we were talking about, like, security in terms of, like, security. If we are talking about security in the hospital or any social programs, racism programs, uh, opportunity programs having to do with the hospital, uh, excuse me, with the library, that indeed is appropriate. But I'm not sure we're doing that right now. We're talking about more in generalities, and that is outside our purview. I doubt that we are enlisted to do that. Thanks for expressing that, because I'd like to clarify um, where this came from, because I did actually look into our library policies handbook, um, as well as the vision for the library um, written by our director. And specifically, um, in the vision, it talked about making sure that the library is a place for all. And 20% of the population in Palmdale are black African American citizens. And if there's a perception that's preventing a part of our population from coming to the library, receiving the services and the programming of the library, as a public servant, I want to address that and make sure that nothing within, you know, within our facility is preventing people from feeling welcome. Um, a, you know, last year we had the discussion because a patron had brought up the issue of people who are experiencing homelessness congregating around the plaza where people are entering the library. And we had a really great conversation about, is that a safety concern? Is it not? Um, how are we addressing it when people who are homeless come in and may have maybe mental health needs or um, personal hygiene needs that they're taking care of in, within the library. And we talked about how to address that and also how to address the community concerns about safety and is it safe. Um, so in the same, in the same spirit, um, having an issue where people are publicly protesting um, at City Hall uh, regularly, that may be something where people want to make sure that if they're coming to the library on a day where a protest is happening, that people still feel safe, that they feel okay to be here. They don't feel like there will be an issue of violence or an issue of um, being harassed as they're attending library programming. Um, my goal here is just to make sure that all of our citizens, including our black patrons, feel safe attending the library. 
and that they feel that if they go, there are, you know, I know we have a security guard that works um, around the library, and, um, but surveillance has come up, and so that was kind of my mindset, is making sure that all people feel safe and welcome to attend the library physically, once it reopens, of course. That part I won't argue with. If it has to do with the hospital, I keep pointing to bloody hospital, if it has to do with the library, you're absolutely correct, mm -hmm. okay? But we must stay within the confines of our purpose here. But if we step out of that thing legally, I wonder if we're stepping on rather tenuous legal grounds there. Now, I'm not, not talking about any major felony events, of course. Right, sure. But uh, this is just be careful of what our bounds are. Well, yeah, and this is, again, this is not like, a, we're not voting on anything today. I just wanted to bring it up as discourse because even though we're not going to be, you know, we're not ourselves saying we're voting on cameras getting installed. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that those issues are being brought up and being addressed by city council. Um, because, of course, we work in conjunction with them. We are a city library, not an L.A. County library. So that was kind of my mind frame in bringing that up. Okay, and if I may respond, sure. um, I would like to say that absolutely safety is number one. Um, concern and, and as you mentioned we discussed some of the feedback from the surveys and because yeah. it wasn't a huge um, indicator but there were some comments about safety and mm -hmm. as you rightly mentioned uh, I believe our, our belief is that that's because of people feeling uncomfortable about people in a homeless situation mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and two comments I would make one is you may not be aware, but we uh, we provide comment cards when we're open to the public, of course. <laughs> uh, well, we provide opportunity for comments online as well. Um, and I see those, um, and we get a number of those uh -huh. turned in. Uh, some are complimentary, some are raising concerns and complaints, and, and, we, appre and we want that kind of feedback. Uh, since I've been here a little over three years, I... Granted, it's not a scientific study, but I've never received any comments from a black uh, African-American patron expressing any concerns about safety or, or our services. Um, for the record, I did receive one complaint from someone of Latino descent who felt like we weren't providing enough, as many displays, mm -hmm. um, promoting materials about Latino culture as we were other cultures. And so we worked to rectify that, be more cognizant of that. Um, and the last thing I would say is if, uh, if, if any trustee, uh, if you feel there are specific things that we are uh, coming short up on, whether it's the African-American part of our community or any other group, I, we would want to know and we would work to address those. I'm not aware of any problems or complaints where African-Americans have felt unsafe. And I appreciate that, yeah. Because, because of their race. Yeah, and, and I think that it's really come to the forefront because of recent issues. So maybe in the past um, there haven't been any issues, but there's a memorial right outside our doors, and someone died there. So there, there's a pretty recent issue that's, that's making people feel afraid to go places. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I'm, and I'm speaking from having spoke with community activists. Um, I've been to recent protests. I've been, you know, listening to colleagues and friends and members of the public. Um, so I'm speaking, I'm not going to name names because that would be um, a violation of their confidentiality and possibly safety. But that's where, that's where the idea is coming from. So, um, but I, I, and I do appreciate that. I like that the comment cards are open and available for that. Um, and one of the suggestions I have on the next agenda item kind of addresses that also. Okay. So we can get more data on that. But does anyone else have a comment on that or... Anything you want to share? On, on anything or just that one, that one issue? Just, um, just regarding patron safety services and anything we can do to when, um When we do the survey each year, we, uh, as I recall, we had some comments in there about safety, didn't we? Because that's something we could always do in our survey is just survey people and how safe they feel when they come in the library. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And just to clarify, is it every year? Because I thought that was um, when that we came. It was a um, part yeah. of a multi-year. It, it has not been a uh, established as an annual yeah. thing yet. It might become that. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that, that yeah. seems to be a perfectly logical place to put it in sure. there. You know, and they could put comments as well. Yeah. Because the comments. Do you feel safe were... walking through the parking lot? Do you feel safe entering the door? Do you feel safe in the library? Yeah. Do and you feel can... safe leaving your children alone in the children's section while you browse other sections? Yeah, just perceptions of just safety. Just some perceptions of how people feel. Absolutely. That'll, that'll give us some direction. Yeah. Next right. time we do a survey. Yeah. 
Thank you. Any comments um, from our online trustees? I just want to know how do we encourage people to actually take surveys? That is a great question. <laughs> I had some ideas that I was going to share in the next um, agenda item. <laughs> I think incentives are always good. Um, one of one of the ideas was especially if we want to get um, opinions from our black community members um, and thinking about ways that we can definitely support our black community members is I would be willing to sponsor some gift cards to black owned businesses um, for people that are filling out service, uh, surveys. So that's one idea. That way it doesn't come out of our library or friend's budget. <laughs> we need that money for other things. Um, or maybe we can brainstorm with our uh, media committee. Um, and then also, um, when I've been speaking with community activists um, at recent protests and community events and rallies, um, they have a working email list of community members who are wanting to engage in public uh, meetings, wanting to engage in what's going on and change and reform. So if I, they have a working email list, so I'd be more than willing to share surveys um, disseminated by the library with those leaders, with those local leaders. That way we can get um, a pretty good survey sampling back. Okay. Thanks, Trustee Morris. You're welcome. Any other comments? If not, we'll leave that as it is and move on to item number 11. Um, I did write a statement for this to keep myself on track, um, so bear with me. I'm going to be reading for a few minutes. But um, I added this item because um, this is a national conversation, and if we want to make local change, it starts with us. So um, I know at the last meeting I kind of addressed that. Um, with my own work on anti-racism and um, not only within myself just as an individual but as a teacher I'm, wor um, I'm working with colleagues at looking at ways we can uh, decolonize and further our efforts to be better allies to our black community members and our students so I of course as a public servant want to extend that work into the library the library is a public institution and um, I'll just I'll read my statement and my suggestions and I'm definitely open to conversation open to correction open to ideas. Um, so, um, I wanted to begin by explaining why I added these items to the agenda and give some context to frame our discussion. This discussion is not one that can be held in one meeting, one month, or one year. It is a conversation that needs to be ongoing, not only between us as representatives of our community, but with our patrons who we serve. Our country is delving into the necessary and long overdue work of deconstructing racism from within systems that have long excluded or oppressed people of color, specifically our black community. We need to look into our own library and see what we can do to further the collective and individual efforts to undo racism in our society and in our own lives. In addition, the events surrounding the unfortunate death of Mr. Robert Fuller on City Hall property, which is directly next to our library, absolutely has an impact on our black community members and their perception of our library's safety for black patrons. These are tough conversations that need to happen on our part so that we can ensure all members of our community that our library is indeed a place for all. In the January Library Board meeting of 2019, our committed library director, Mr. Shoup, presented his vision for the mission and purposes of the library during this era. Not only is our library committed to keeping our collection relevant in a digital age, but we should also be attentive to keeping our collection relevant in an age of civil unrest and discourse. Mr. Shoup spoke to the importance of, and I'm quoting from his, um, his notes, ordering new and relevant materials for the collection and withdrawing items for the same collection using professional training, judgment, standards, and protocol for making such decisions. Today I offer the challenge and opportunity to do that by using judgment to evaluate a collection for racial diversity and inclusiveness. I ask that our library seeks using the information discussed by board members to order new and relevant materials that our community is actively seeking. Many of the resources being sought are on back order online or on hold at other libraries. This in itself attests to the reality that our resources need to be increased to meet the demands of the public. And I have provided a chart with some examples of that that I'll cover later. While the public is observing the stay at home orders, the demand for audio and eBooks from libraries is increasing. Mr. Shoup also spoke to his vision for a library that strives for balance meaning a representation of every genre of fiction that the patrons are interested in, 
and or opposing viewpoints on every topic covered in the nonfiction collection. Again, the information being presented today for discussion and action would assert that our library can achieve that vision by providing new resources that help patrons address anti-racism work or affirm their identity through representation in our collection. Additionally, although our library does already offer programming centering black culture, we can always increase our efforts to better represent our patrons as well as include the black community members in leading programs. This was also spoken as a vision in Mr. Mr. Shoup's statement when he wrote, the library can and should be open to offering a program on any topic covered in the collection. His summary statement included the positions of the diversity of the collection, the variety of the programs offered, and being united in striving to make the library a place where all residents feel welcome, being known and seen as an unbiased place, and residents from all walks of life and background can and do come together to learn, to share, to question, to debate, to interact, to engage, and to discuss. Our anti-racist and inclusive efforts for our black community is a, is a vital step at this time to ensuring we uphold the library's vision. I can never know what it's like to live as a black person in America, but I can absolutely listen to the experiences and concerns of our black community and stand alongside them through words and actions. The following suggestions are beginning steps our library can take. I'm absolutely open to correction and direction if I'm misrepresenting any needs of the black community. In speaking recently with community activists in the Antelope Valley, there is a desire for more of a presence and voice of black community members in public entities and decision making. I'm speaking today on how our library can continue to be an important platform for education, discourse, and positive change in our community. The following are suggestions for the library to assist and take part in the anti-racism efforts of the community, and I'll be happy to email these um, or you can take notes. Number one, provide literature and resources to patrons that focus on anti-racism work by increasing hard copies of texts in demand and making more e-versions available if they already aren't. Number two, take inventory of our current collection and evaluate how much of our collection reflects the work of black authors. Also, remove problematic literature that inaccurately narrates the experience of black, indigenous, and persons of color in children's books, for example, that depict slavery as a normalized, routine way of life versus a violent and dehumanizing experience. Number three, provide increased literature and resources to patrons that include the works of black, indigenous, and persons of color authors for adults, adolescents, and youth. Number four, provide increased programming opportunities in accordance with safety guidelines that honor black, indigenous, and persons of color's cultures and experiences. For example, Juneteenth, Kwanzaa, Native American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, etc. Number five, reach out to black library directors for insight on how to better meet the needs of our black patrons. Number six, create and disseminate a survey about black, the black community's needs and perceptions of the library and also gather names of community members who are interested in leading programs or activities through the library. Number seven, apply for grants that would help supply and secure additional funding for diversifying our resources and hiring of additional diverse personnel or contracted workers for programming. Number eight, advertise efforts on social media platforms, be transparent about the changes and processes taking place, and be open to community feedback. Number nine, increase Friends of the Library membership for Black patrons. I'm personally willing to start by um, paying for 10, um, mem ugh, 10 memberships for Black community members that would be interested in joining our Friends of the Library. And number 10, add to the monthly agenda an item to discuss ongoing commitments and efforts surrounding issues of racial justice, diversity, and inclusion within the library services and collection. For example, having an African American Advisory Council representative speaking at our monthly meetings just as we do with our friends. And lastly, number 11, looking into the historical records of our community, which we house here at the library, and evaluating whether or not the black community's history and contributions to our area are recorded and documented. For example, the history of Sun Village, which is an unincorporated part of Palmville. So um, I'm going to stop talking and let you guys respond. Well, I actually had some questions, because this, this actually came up um, several months ago. Mm -hmm. And I know we did have some conversation about the racial equity issue and the importance mm -hmm. of that. So, and I think we were, we were we, some of the questions that we asked you were about the, uh, our collection. And, and you were mentioning that all of the stuff that we get, the, the service that we use, 
they they kind of look at those types of things. And I'm just wondering, do you know specifically um, how they balance their their collections out? Is that material that they have available to us that kind of indicate how they do the collections? I do remember you asking that question, so thanks yeah. for bringing it back up. Yeah. Uh, Robert, clarify, are you, are you talking about collection development that, that we our, our procedures for, for well, doing that? How, you know, how we're, we're using our service, our library services. And so we use a, a, a library catalog of materials. And I'm just wondering what kind of uh, racial filters they use, what kind of uh, community input they get in developing collections that we use. Okay. Robert, I interrupt here a bit. What we just heard here should be stricken from the record. In the absence of that, it should be put down as the opinion of one member of this board of directors. I say that because on the schedule, under number seven, it says, or 11 rather, discussion of current anti-resources, anti-racism resources available in the library. Current resources available. That is not what we're talking about here. That's what I'm talking this about. Is, that may be, but that is off agenda. If we want that on there, then put it on the future agenda, and I would run this by the city council, and they say that they want us to discuss this. We are appointed by the city council. We are way off of what our charge is. In this, I question the legality of doing this then, well, especially since it's not even on the agenda. John, but, I don't totally disagree with you, but I'm just, what I, my point is, is that I think some of this has already been done, <clears> and that we've already done this, and so we might have some things available to us already with our collection, that, because when, well, I think I, I need to let you speak on that, on how we get our collections, and what types of processes we use to, to get the different materials that we get. Um, well, and, and just to, before we let him respond, this is all based on the library's vision, which we're responsible for upholding and discussing as far as, like, I've read through the library handbook and the policy, so I don't feel like I'm out of line we, discussing we these issues. We are all entitled to our opinion, but I'm That's telling, exactly what this is. That is, is not opinion. what this thing is, is supposed to be doing without direction from the city council. We are going beyond our authority here. What exactly is going on beyond the authority? That's it. The, the city council has not said, I want the library to address resources, availability, or anything else you want to call it, through the, through the library. That has to come from the city council. We do not have the authority to make that decision on our own. That's all I'm saying here. I may or may not agree with everything that you said, but that's irrelevant at this time. I hear Trustee Morris trying to comment. Well, yes, yes, I would like to... Is it possible that we could actually get uh, clarification on what our roles and responsibilities are as library trustees of the city of Palmdale? Okay, I wouldn't mind having that. That is a great idea. I would, I, I would like. For, I would like. I, I would like to have like you know so that we are clear huh. on what it is that we are supposed to be doing. I because I'm. I thought this was just a, a conversation. Yes, and, and I'm totally fine with um, with tabling this conversation um, because, like I said, I did read through the entire manual that was provided to me by the library upon appointment three years ago <laughs> and looked at the roles and responsibilities, but I'm absolutely comfortable with um, tabling this topic so we can get clarification on our roles and whether or not we're out of bounds. And if we are, yeah. I absolutely would apologize, um, but I'm basing this based on what I've read within the guidelines of the handbook I was yeah. provided. I think I'm in the middle ground where I, I do see some of the points that he's making because we are not an elected body and that really limits yeah. what we can do and what Absolutely. because really our elected bodies are the only ones that can really make certain decisions. Mm. I think I'm just looking for what things are already in place that a lot of these things might already be in place that we could take a look at um, to, to meet what you're talking about. Um, it's just information from Yeah, that. and I did provide a table in the notes that I took down. I actually did the work of looking at our current collection and looking, because, again, this is all taken from things like previous minutes and previous notes and the vision, and one of the roles that we have is giving feedback and guiding and supporting the director in his job, and, of course, we're not voting on anything. We're not, we're not changing. We do have the ability to change policy, um, but we are able to speak to our suggestions for what should be happening in the library as far as programming and our collections and, and ensuring that we're upholding the library's code of ethics. Um, and if, so. I'm, if I'm not, if I'm 
I thought that it was part of the trustee's responsibility to give feedback mm -hmm. to city council. Yeah. May I suggest that we ask the city council? And, I, and that's what I thought that all of this really was about is having some developing some feedback yes. for it on to the council. This is it. Uh, Alan, that may well be true, but again, we're making presumptions here. And we need direction from the city council, specifically from the city attorney, what we should or should not be getting into, what is our charge. As I recall, as Robert Craig was wrong, we operate under the education code of the state of California. Essentially, is that true? That is correct. All right. Okay. Then we should not be violating that education code, and I'm concerned so we about don't, doing we don't that. Have, I don't me personally, as an individual, I don't have that code, those codes available. I'd like to read them for myself. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why we need direction from the city attorney. Yeah, that's that's what we should idea. be doing oh, here. We are no, getting I'm really off, to off topic here, or, or not necessarily off topic. Well, but, I, I think we're that getting this, way off what our charge is. And if this was off topic, I apologize because I did request um, the, the formal procedure for this, for adding these items to the agenda. Um, a couple weeks ago, and it did go through um, the director and through Grace. So if we needed to do that in the future to add items to the agenda, I'll make sure to do that. Um, but I did run it through the appropriate channels before adding it to the agenda. So if I may, um, <clears throat> I don't mind stating on the record that um, I, as a city employee, do not necessarily have the answers you're looking for in terms of what your charge is as the board. You know, specifically, I think that specifically should be a question that we could reach out to our legal department on and get some clarification. If that's something the board would ask us to do, I would be certainly willing to do that and try to seek that information that you're looking for. That sounds like Can a we, good idea because yeah, we want to make that trustee so. board makes that formal request. So, sure. So, request so, I, so I'm understanding the formal request is to to get an uh, understanding and, and, and direction on what your charge and what your responsibilities are as a library Good. board of trustees. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe even bring up this um, agenda item and ask if it's out of line and if I need to bring it to city council instead of bringing it up here, but because right. it is a library right. surrounded discussion regarding our collection and our resources and the programs that we're making available to our patrons, I would... I would assume from what I've been provided by the city that it is an on-topic conversation, but I'm absolutely willing to hear from the city attorney and table this conversation for the next meeting. Is the turnaround pretty quick on that feedback? Like we would be able to discuss it in our August meeting? I, I wouldn't make that promise necessarily, okay. but I will do everything I can to make that happen. I mean, it should, it should be quick, but I, I you know, Good. to get clarification on that. They've got a full and I'm not, plate I'm, these days that may not be done by the next meeting. I'm not going to push them. I mean, they've got well, they've got tons of things to face right now. Yeah. Okay. Our, our, our city, as you guys know, is very responsive very to responsive. these things. So yeah, uh, I just wouldn't want to promise anything on their behalf. Okay. No, I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Right. Um, and I'll send a follow-up email as well. And thank you, Trustee Morris, for your comments regarding um, clarification. And thank you. So are we just going to table all other comments? Does anyone else have a comment that they'd like to share before we move on? I just would like to know, I mean, because it was something that came up before. I know I brought it up before, just kind of how they, you know, when you, when you get your collections, how that's done. And because I know just from, ed, just from school libraries, mm -hmm. all the research that goes into the books that get chosen. So I'm just kind of interested mm -hmm. what kind of research goes behind that. And I think that kind of reaches into our function right there is providing resources for our community. Absolutely. And on that note, I'd be happy to include that in a future director's report for myself great. and maybe bring one or two librarians with and we can talk about the procedures that we follow in in uh, purchasing materials for the collection. Yeah, that would be that would be great. It'd be a great information item to see how that because you know those questions have come up in the community <clears> lately and to have those answers would be great to know how those things were chosen and what kind of thought goes into it. Mm -hmm. and, and and a short answer I would give to the questions that have been asked and in the dialogue is that you de the board of trustees definitely establishes policy and I, I use you as uh, as like a, uh, a sounding board yeah <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a focus group for ideas and suggestions uh, beyond that I do agree that your scope is fairly narrow mm -hmm. and I appreciate that the city will be willing to provide more legal clarification um, and 
one of my roles as director is to um, kind of inform and, and, and educate you, frankly, because none of you have worked in a library yet, I believe. <laughs> and, and, and so one of my purposes is to inform you about how we do the th why we do the things we do, as, I mean, looking for ideas and suggestions from you, but also to inform you and educate you. And I'm going to get to that in my director's report on this topic. Great. Uh, that's, tonight. that's perfect. That'd be a perfect place to address it, too. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll look forward to um, further clarification, and we'll table that topic unless anyone else has anything else to say. No. Okay. I'm I am. Yep. I, I, I am curious about uh, is, um, is the library being considered uh, in um, COVID-19 protocol for reopening? Uh, I, I will address that in my director's report. Okay, thank you. All right, so with everyone's permission, we'll move on to the director's report, item 12. All right, thank you. Um, and if I don't cover something, feel free to let me know. Uh, but the first item on my director's report is in relation to the topic that we just uh, discussed, uh, that you just discussed. Uh, immediately following last month's uh, board meeting, <clears throat> I asked Jamie Lee Beck, our uh, assistant director and adult services um, librarian for the library, to work on a bibli bibliography of sorts to show what kind of materials we have already in the collection uh, re relating to racial uh, issues. And in the spirit of um, what I just talked about, uh, training and edification, I apologize if you really don't want to hear this, but I think it could be of use to you to understand um, how libraries work and when it comes to searching a collection, a library collection, some of the challenges and why, frankly, why you need a librarian to help. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you'll bear with me, years ago I, I was working at a reference desk at a busy main library in Ogden, Utah. And I'm just going to use this as an example because it, 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 it will inform you about some of the challenges of retrieving lists of items from an online catalog, for example. Um, I was working at this busy reference desk, I was by myself, my colleague was at a, on a break. A patron came and asked for information on steroid use in sports. It was a hot topic back then, still is. I thought, great, this will be easy. <laughs> I went over, typed in what seemed like logical terms to bring up materials in that collection. That was about a 250,000 item collection in that library. Nothing was coming up. And I was uh, frustrated and embarrassed because I'm the librarian. <laughs> this was young, early in my career. Thankfully, my colleague came back. I told her what I was up against. And she says, oh, I've run into that myself. The subject heading you need to use is called doping in sports. Now, I'm, I'm just sharing that because in library land, there are official subject headings. And, and when catalogers decide what an item, how it's going to be cataloged, they use this official Bible, if you will, <laughs> of subject headings. It used to be Sears, now it's Library of Congress, establishes the official subject headings that the catalogers are supposed to use across the country, and even other nations would use LC or Library of Congress as a standard. And at that time, this was uh, late 80s, the, su the subject heading had not been updated. Doping in sports, somebody decided that was the subject heading back then. Well, I just use that as an example that subject headings, official subject headings, continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. And you will see as I share this with you, I hope I have enough here. Now, I apologize, I didn't get this today um, until today. So, Trustee Hankin, Trustee Morris, I will send this in electronic format to you. I apologize, I did not get that to you in advance. Oh, thank you. And just to clarify, as you're passing those out, um, are you in, um, insinuating that because the coding system has changed, that might change the way that when we're looking at an inventory of material, the way it's representing the types of books that we're looking up? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And you will see examples of that. Yeah, hey, yeah. these are exactly the things I looked up on my, uh, my report. Okay, good job. Great, we're in cohesion. Yeah, you, you get an A for your library skills. You sorry. get an A for your <laughs> Uh, so, the, the, the pamphlet is intended as a marketing piece to focus on the issues that are in our community right now. Mm -hmm. And so these are titles that are available in our collection, um, either 
a physical copy or online through Hoopla or Cloud Library. So these, these are some of the titles that Jamie Lee selected. I thought it was a good sampling. Jamie Lee made this pamphlet? Yes. This is beautiful. Yeah, Please tell her that job. she's done an amazing job. Yeah. Now the little insert, I asked her to provide this as well. And this gets at the example that I just gave you about doping in sports. Mm -hmm. You will see that under anti-racism there are only five items. One reason for that, one big reason, that is a new subject heading. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't used until recently. Wow. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't items dealing with social relations. It just wasn't cataloged that way. Sure. So when you look under race relations, 303 items. So, so, so just to so understand a little bit more about searching for items and why it's helpful to have a librarian <laughs> in, yeah. involved in the searching yeah. process. These are all the different subject headings that Jamie Lee looked up. Now, this is, these are the number of items available to our patrons through our online catalog. So it includes our, our library plus the Inland Library Network. Because mm -hmm. if you recall, we belong to the Inland Library Network. And when you search, you can search all of their holdings. And just well. to follow up on that, I did, mm -hmm. like when I looked at my own research with some of these very same titles, including several others, um, I kind of cross-referenced the number of weeks that it was either on the New York Times bestseller list, uh -huh. as far as like a, a demand, yeah. and then the supply is, um, I mentioned both the library's hard copies that we offer, yeah. as well as the online copies that we network with. Yeah. So for example, the first one that's mentioned is White Fragility. Um, it's been <laughs> on the New York Times uh, bestseller list for 15 weeks. Um, our, li our library currently has zero hard copies, but there are four copies available through our network, but all of them are checked out currently. <laughs> However, it is available on any resource and audiobook. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. You still get an A for <laughs> your library skills. Uh, so I provide this as kind of a backdrop um, and to give you an idea of, of what we already have. I will also add <clears throat> that... Um, as part of our collection development practice, it's we don't do this a lot. Once or twice a year, I and our two collection development librarians, that's Jamie Lee Beck, the assistant director, and now uh, Jackie Seacamp, she's the uh, youth services librarian, uh, we make a trip to Barnes & Noble right here in Palmdale, support the local economy, and there's something very useful about seeing what they have on their shelves, what they are selling here in, in our local bookstore. We did that in June. And bless their hearts, <laughs> they had a huge display of um, titles related to racial um, relations. Mm -hmm. And we purchased at least 20 physical copies right that day. Uh, well, I did, because <laughs> I was helping to choose. And, and those items haven't been added yet, because it yeah. takes a while to get them cataloged and processed. Sure. But, but they are in the library waiting to be added to the collection. That's exciting. So that's part of our collection development. We don't, most of our ordering is done through other means, but we will do that once or twice a year just to go shopping. Great, right. and I did bring a selection today from my own classroom library, just as examples in case there are other titles that we haven't thought about. Or I, I have a lot of new releases in my bag, so I'll share those later on. Okay. Um, that's pretty much all I was gonna say about on, on that topic. Um, is that we do have a fairly robust collection already, mm -hmm. and we will continue to add items. The only other thing I will add is we will purpose, as you mentioned, as you quoted me, opposing viewpoints. Yeah. And, 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 and the one slippery slope that we need to remember is that not everybody agrees <laughs> on how to approach these issues. Of course. And uh, several years ago, I had a librarian come to me, and, and, and bless his heart, he said, you know, should we be pulling all the items that speak about global warming being a hoax? And I said, no, <laughs> because they're entitled to that opinion. <laughs> and, uh, and there are opposing viewpoints. And, and so that, that's just another example that we, that we need to be uh, Balanced, careful of. As yeah. you said in your report. Yeah. Yes. Did you actually count all these yourself? I did not, but Jamie Lee did. <laughs> she, she had a month to do it, and bless her heart. Been an she, evening, you, know you, <laughs> you can do you can do it online, or but but still, yeah. It, it, I, I gave her a month, and she came through. I think I'd rather empty the cat box than do that. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure that gets in the minutes. Minutes. Um, okay, m moving on. So regarding uh, kind of an update regarding library services, we're continuing the front door services. Patrons can. 
and, and more are taking advantage of that service. We're, we're still not overrun, but the numbers are increasing as people become more uh, aware of this service and more comfortable. So again, patrons can call on the phone during the hours that we have staff there uh, to request items to be checked out on their card, or they can place items on hold. And then we check the items out in advance. We place them in a paper bag. That's, we bought those back in March. Um, <clears throat> when they come to the door, there's a table, so there's social distancing. Staff wear facial coverings, and we place the bag on the table so there's no physical contact, and then they take their items. And many patrons are very, very happy to have this service. Quick question about that. I did see it advertised on the city's website. Has other have other social media platforms advertised that pickup service? We've put it out on our on our Facebook. Facebook, okay. Much Instagram and, and, also. And Instagram. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Good. Now along those lines, the going back to the Inland Library Network that we're a part of, we when we became a part of that network, thanks to the city providing funds for a courier to run between the libraries. Uh, that service was started two years ago. It was suspended in April, May, and June because of COVID-19. But as other libraries began to at least offer curbside or front door services, the courier service has now started again in July. And so our patrons that are using our services are much happier because now they're getting their items from the Inland Library Network uh, members. And... Uh, that's increasing usage as well. <clears throat> uh, other than that, regarding COVID-19, we are, as I said before, we are subject to City of Palmdale's um, adherence to LA County's Safer at Home order. And as soon as we get the word that we can open to walk-in services, we will do that. But we are all waiting for LA County to give that okay. And if you haven't heard the latest order Shut issued on Monday, out. yeah, we don't think that's going to happen yeah. anytime real soon. The teacher said to me, Matt wants to switch classes. Is that a or you under attack? I don't know. Is that a fire alarm? Once we do get the word, we, we've been preparing. We, the city has purchased the, uh, the stickers. They've been placed on the floor six feet apart for, for where lines would form. The city provided uh, shields at the service desks so that um, the, the, the sneeze guards. We, uh, the city has provided additional hand sanitizer machines, so we're ready with that. We, the city maintenance staff moved all the furniture out except, yeah, well, all, all the chairs. And you mentioned tables the computers. Are gone. The computers won't be um, in use, right, because of the demands on hygiene and like cleaning them would basically be impossible. Yeah. The one question I had was about the reference computer where um, patrons can look up um, the availability of an item or request them. Will that computer also be removed and patrons would just ask verbally for an we, item? The, um, the, the OPAC, we call it OPAC, the Online Public Access Catalog. Um, there will be a quiz on that later. <laughs> uh, the online public access catalog will be available so people can search. Okay. Um, and the self-checkout machines will be available okay. so they don't have to come to the staff windows if they don't want to. So we'll just encourage people to practice good hygiene, yeah. wash your hands, use Purell before you yes. touch these computers. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we, we are leaving the computer, the public computers on the tables. We've covered them with table coverings so you can't access them and put up yellow caution tape uh, so that there is no place for patients to sit down and, and, and linger, which we're sad about, but we'd like to be able to at least offer some kind of service. Mm -hmm. So that is what the plan is whenever we get the okay. Okay, moving on. Summer reading program is underway. We do not have huge numbers like we would like to have, but we are. We do have some takers, um, and we did get we did get a few more just this week, and I'll, I'll touch on that. The prizes are being offered. Virtual prizes are like gift cards, and a lot of people are taking advantage of that when they reach certain milestones in their reading chart, their reading progress, and they can request a five dollar gift card. 
<clears throat> Again, all these things are being funded by the friends, all the prizes. Thank you, friends. Yep. A few are taking advantage of the offer to come to the door and, and by appointment and get a bag of prizes. And I had to be walking by the other day when a mom with three young children came to get their bags. And it, it wasn't quite like Santa Claus, but it was approaching that kind of excitement to see what they got in there in their bag. So we're glad that that is happening. Along the same lines, the summer lunch program, um, <clears throat> if you recall the last two years we provide, we partnered with the Palmdale School District in the library, meals were distributed here and they could come, patrons could come in and, and they did to eat the meals in the library. Obviously we couldn't do that this year. The state library was still providing grant money, realized, and they've been very flexible, very good to work with. Um, if libraries felt like they could come up with some kind of an outreach summer lunch program and still connect it to the library, then they were willing to work with libraries. And thankfully, uh, we had a couple of false starts. However, and we did, ultimately, it's a late start, but right now, we are now doing a summer lunch, I'm, I'm calling it summer lunch and literacy program, uh, <laughs> because the, currently the Palmdale School District, they were providing grab-and-go meals uh, at 10 sites. Right now it's nine, nine schools in Palmdale School District. Um, over 6,000 meals a day that they're providing. <clears throat> Who is Palmdale School District? Palmdale School District. And they'll be continuing mm -hmm. that because their board voted... Um, the other night, last night, to extend distance learning through at least the first semester. Okay. Um, so that'll be continuing. Yeah, I expect them. I I heard that they were going to go to distance ed, yeah. and when COVID closed the schools, I know that they, the the nutrition services is their division that that provides the meals, mm -hmm. and they get federal funding yes. for for the food. Um, they were they they called it emergency meals, sir meal services that they were doing at the schools, and I suspect that they will do that again in yes. the fall. And so, as we, once we get through this program, we will look to see if there are ways that we can partner with them in the fall as well. I think that's great. But right now, we, uh, so we're able to hire, with the city's help, we're able to hire four teen interns, 10 hours a week, and they're coming to the library practicing social distancing, they are stuffing bags <laughs> with literacy type activities, crayons, coloring sheets, uh, puzzles, little literacy educational type toys. Um, also, bookmarks and information about the summer reading program. And we, we just started doing this this week. On, on Monday of this week was our first time to be able to actually deliver these packets at a site. We're going to a different school each day. <clears throat> and uh, and, the, and the state library is providing the funding to pay the teens to buy the materials we're putting in the bags <clears throat> and we are buying they haven't arrived yet but we'll be getting, getting the books out as soon as we can uh, there's, a, there's a company called Scholastic who is a great company for providing inexpensive books for Especially for kids. Book orders. <laughs> yeah. Book orders, book fairs, at library, yeah. school libraries, things like that. They've been doing it for decades. Where, where are you going to get these books? Scholastic. Sch Scholastic is the name of the company. They have a lot of dollar books that are like classic literature. Yes. Well, like five and uh, five dollars and, and under. And they're purchased through what budget? Uh, the state li I applied for a grant, and the state library is is paying for them. So it's grant, grant funded. Is, is the grant... Has the grant been given yet? Yes. Okay, so you have the money for it? Yes. So it's not putting anybody in debt for it? Correct. Okay. I gave the check to Eric yesterday. Okay, that's what I wanted to be sure. <laughs> okay, it's a good program, but... You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we couldn't do it on our own. Okay. Okay. But the state uh, library well, was very supportive. Any kind of deficit spending here. Right. We have enough of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. And so uh, 20000 so it's a $23,000 grant. 3000 of it is paying the teens... The teen interns, the other twenty thousand is buying the materials going in the bags, and then the, the books from Scholastic, and they are all ninety nine cent or dollar ninety nine books. Yeah. But they really look nice. They're glossy covers, soft back. Mm -hmm. 
And Good. we have no doubt. The, uh, the school district, our contacts with the school district are ecstatic that, that we are doing this. In fact, I'm not, it was supposed to happen today that my contact at the district, her name is Candace, that she was going to get AV Press over at the site because she wanted them to cover this partnership that, that's going on. And uh, we, we have every reason to believe that in some of these families, these free books may be the only family library that they have. And so we're, we're thrilled to be a part of that. And I will... Who's, name, who's uh, the grant from, Robert? State Library of California. State Library. That's the name of the foundation or commission or whatever it is? Well, briefly, each state in the union has a state library. It, it's managed or organized differently, each state, but each state has a state library office. Okay. And one of their primary functions is to, is to be the state contact for federal monies that come to the states. Which is answer my next question. It's a federal program. Yes, it, okay. it, it is a pass-through. Okay. It's federal money I get that's it. passed through the state. I get it. I understand. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I made it out yesterday. I, I think you saw the, the picture of the, the, the normal bill was there. Okay. And uh, I know on Tuesday we handed out over 200 packets. Yesterday um, it sounded like about 600 packets. And today, I, I, I know they ran out, <laughs> but I, I haven't uh, heard the numbers yet. And, and we're just excited to be doing something. The school district is ecstatic. Oh, and I wanted to mention that during my conversations with the school district, they told me that uh, they, have, uh, they have 20 children who are in a homeless situation but are currently, I guess, being housed in a local hotel or motel, mm -hmm. and that they are... The school district is delivering meals to them, and they want to. They're going to deliver packets oh, uh, for us as well. So that uh, really appreciate the city's help pulling us together, and and it because we're late. It's only going to be this week and next week, and then then they stop their summer lunch program. But then we'll start focusing on the fall for. Uh, I, I want to thank the city and the library for, I mean, there's a lot of things that just got cut because of COVID and the complexities of redoing things. And this is, as an educator, this is so important to me that kids continue to focus on literacy. I know that families, a lot of parents are going nuts because the library isn't open and it normally is. So I, I really appreciate that that program is still a priority to us. And I know last year we kind of talked about it, but it was kind of the tail end of the program. It was a little too late to do it because the teens had already left. But if we could honor those teens, those interns, yeah. maybe like at the next meeting, just a little certificate and, you know, yeah. thank them for their service. Let's, let's do that. Yes, thank And you. maybe even um, Candace <clears throat> from Palmdale, just thank her also for working in conjunction with the library. Yeah, I like that. Yes, thank you. You got that down there, right? <laughs> thank you. Okay, great. I know they want to come to a board meeting. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, any other... I have one other topic. Any other questions about what I've said so far? No. Okay, then I just want to, I'm happy to announce that, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned any of this before, but, so Miss Shea, a staff member who's been, do, who's been our story time person for about 10 years, and she has her own following, because she is so good <laughs> <laughs> at story time. Shea is great, she's a great employee. Uh, she just felt like she needed a change. and uh, She's an employee of the uh, library? Yes, yeah. Uh, Shay Hawken is her name. Yeah. And uh, she just needed a change, and, and that happens. You know, that happens with many of us. And so now she has become our uh, our volunteer court. Same official title, Library Associate 3, but now her emphasis is volunteer coordinator. And she's great at that, too. So, so she's focusing on that. So we've been recruiting for our new uh, story time lead person, which is close to the goddess or god of the library. Yeah. You can do without a director for a while, but not without a story time person. And uh, and we're happy that after uh, extensive recruitment, we have a lot of great applicants, but we have our new person starting tomorrow, and we're excited about her. Her name is April Keith. April, I want to tell you a little bit about her. She... Um, She has a, over five years previous experience at Lexington Public Library, Lexington, Kentucky. She has a bachelor's degree in K 
communication arts and philosophy. She actually has a master's degree in marketing, and we're going to be taking advantage of that. <laughs> She's with a Latina. Aren't they both background experienced in the marketing? I'm sorry. What? In the victory, sorry, from the front. Oh yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, April also. I mean, she has previous library experiences, as, as I mentioned, but she is. Uh, she's been adjunct faculty in uh, public speaking at the Uni University of Cumberland. Um, she has experience with virtual programming already, which we will be moving in, more in that direction. And so we look forward to April's arrival with us tomorrow. And as a little side note and anecdote, I don't think she would mind me sharing. This is not why she got hired, but <laughs> um, she came to California with her boyfriend, I think, last year. Uh, mainly because of him. He is a voice actor, and he is currently working for Audible Books. Oh, well, we're recruiting him for the next Ink Fest. Well, best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I look forward to meeting him, now. too. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's recording for Audible Books. Very cool. Good for him. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. That's so presumably he has a nice uh, voice, good modulation. I would better. think so. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't heard him yet. No. Well, that's a reasonable <laughs> presumption if he's yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. So we're looking forward to her joining us tomorrow. Awesome. Uh, that concludes my director's report. Item number 14, staff comments. Could you give us a follow-up on the fees, the fees and fines? Oh, no. yeah, I, I apologize, but I have not focused on that at all since uh, COVID-19. There have been, mm -hmm. it would seem like there's not much going on, but it's amazing how much is going on with unusual Well, as, stuff. as we all know, there's a lot going on, and this has a low priority, and we yeah. all accept that. Okay, no, thank don't you. let it just get lost in the backwash. And, yeah, and that's, that's why we keep it on the agenda, because we do want to yeah. come back to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, regarding item number 13 on the agenda, with everyone's permission, just to continue to table that topic until we do have the reports that we requested a couple months before COVID hit. Yeah. Um, we had requested information about, um, one, how much of our budget was um, comprised of library fines and fees being collected. We also requested information about um, what types of um, fees we were looking to collect. Was it for lost books or damaged books versus just books that haven't been returned? And um, what demographic of book was really constituting a lot of those? Was it children's books, adult novels? So that's sort of the information we've requested in the past, um, and we'll continue to wait for that until it's the right time and the other things have been taken care of. Okay. Thank <laughs> you for your patience. Yes. Um, item number 14, staff comments? Um, and trust, you have any comments? Or? Okay. Okay, thank you. And thank you for being here. Um, and number 15, um, trustee comments? Any online? No. All right. I will take that as a no. Any from anyone else? I, I do have some comments. Sure. Um, and actually, they're kind of directed more um, towards just the functioning of our, our library. Because I think with COVID, we've had a lot of things that happened with COVID. And the thing that nobody's talking about yet that's going to be an issue is going to be budget. And so one of the things I wanted to just uh, ask is that, you know, you kind of keep us in that loop because that's good. Budgeting issues are things that are, are going to be coming up soon. And I'm sure with all of the things that have been, been going on, cities and municipalities, there's all kinds of budgeting issues that everyone's going to have. So I think keeping in the loop as far as budget is really important right about now to, to make sure we're in, we're in good shape and... You know, when the city knows what they're getting and how that works and, and all that, I think that's just important for us to be in that loop. I appreciate you saying that and bringing that up. That was also on my mind, and I kind of lost sight of that. So thank you, because I know that we get a quarterly report, which kind of does cover things like that. Um, I'd also be interested in knowing what we're looking at at our projections, especially in regards to staffing. Hopefully we won't lose any of our staff, and if we need to reach out for grants or start working on those sorts of things now to secure extra funding. And I don't think anybody has any of these answers yet either, yeah. so it's something that changes day by day, but it's, sure. you know, it's something that we're probably going to need updates on almost every month, I think, at some point, because yeah. the reality of all of this is going to hit every, every municipality eventually. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other trustee comments? All right. Well, then I will adjourn the meeting at 6.47 p.m., and I'll see you guys next month. And next month, we will have Trustee Hankin leading our meeting. All right. I'll be back to the second Tuesday. Second Tuesday, okay.
And are we still not allowing public to come in, or no, that's changing day by day too? 